Hello, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. The warmest of welcomes to what I'd like to describe as the mid-season finale of cocktails and conversations. Throughout the last 10 weeks, you've been with us, you've supported us with your wallet and your heart, I hope, as we have tried to make this lockdown period as enjoyable as it possibly can be for a, a one-week check-in. If we knew at the beginning of this 10-week period, we certainly know it now, that the world is a, an, unimaginably, a, an unimaginably challenging place at times. And, and this week, more than any other across the globe, has shown us that it is full of division and, and anxiety and, and difficulty. But all we can really do, the three of us here today, this evening, is to take a leaf out of all those riders at, at Belmont Park yesterday on the opening day of the of the Naira rescheduled summer meet by providing as best we can the entertainment that only we know how while paying due respect and tribute to the the brilliant endeavors and efforts of all those people across the world who are peacefully protesting to make the world a better place so with that in mind welcome aboard for the next hour hour and a bit however long we want to go on of hopefully what can be a welcome diversion for you nick luck with you alongside Brittany Erton and mark tuberty Brittany, Mark, good evening, and welcome to you both. Britt. Uh, it is uh, wonderful to be here with you guys. And just to follow up on, on those beautiful words that you said, uh, there's a lot of anger, frustration, fear in the country right now, and rightfully so. But I will say the last few days, especially here in Los Angeles, I've seen so many examples of love and kindness and hope uh, that change is not only possible, but afoot as well. So as you said, it, it feels strange to move forward with a show that's fun and celebratory with everything that's going on in the world right now. But that's exactly why this show was created, to bring some levity into our lives and hopefully some smiles and laughter for those at home that are watching. So that's exactly what we're going to do. And Nick, Mark, we've got cocktails to do it and conversation from Graham Motion as well. So I'm happy to be here with you both. And Mark, you have provided the, the best over the last 10 weeks. And, and <laughs> we are not the only ones who say that it's been the highlight watching you at your very best, telling us uh, exactly the difference between, uh, as I said a few weeks ago, a mixologist and a bartender. No humble bartender, Mark Tuberty. Thank you so much, guys. Yeah, it's been a true honor and a pleasure being with you every week, and especially a week like this where so many dramatic events are unfolding throughout the world. And, you know, I, I think it's so important for us to really key into the important messages that, that are being brought to light here and, and how much we really do need some, some change in this world. Um, but I appreciate the compliments. You know, as, as a bartender, I, I focus on the beauty that, that can end up in a glass. And, and it's really meant a lot to me how much people have been participating. Brittany, we talk about it every week. Your parents are so active in making these cocktails every week. I've been getting some amazing messages on Instagram. Uh, Sarah and Dorian Dickinson, I know every week they're making the cocktails as well. So it's really meant a lot to me. And we've got some, some fun cocktails to end our first section before this kind of mid-season break. One of my personal favorites, the maple bourbon old fashioned and a really fun take on a gimlet, the strawberry basil gimlet. So stay tuned. It's, it's going to be a lot of fun, all things considered. We're going to try to make it a bright spot in your week. Perfect. Mark, thank you so much. And, and before we move on, I, I do want to, to raise a glass to two very special horses who we've sadly lost this week because they both... Uh, achieved a, a remarkable double. Breeders' Cup Classic Heroes and Dubai World Cup Heroes, taken from us way too soon, particularly the former. But to arrogate into Pleasantly Perfect, thank you for all the memories that you gave us. And I know both of them have a very special place in the hearts of so many of you. So thank you is all I can say. And our thoughts are with all those people who loved you best and were most closely associated with you throughout your, your glittering careers, Brittany. Yes, absolutely. Cheers to both of them that gave us some pretty incredible moments on the racetrack. Arrogate for me will go down as one of the greatest racehorses I've ever witnessed. Um, and as Bob Baffert said, he took my breath away. And I think he did that for a lot of us. So yes, cheers. Cheers to both. And um, it, it's wonderful that at least we will get to see Arrogate's legacy live on in some of his progeny who are still babies, but we have that to look forward to at least. And, and sometimes, you know, it, it can happen. You you lose a horse far too young in their in their career, either as a racehorse or a, or as a stallion, and, and you find their legacy can live on. We lost Dubai Millennium, very early, brilliant horse, and he'd only had a handful of foals on the ground from one crop, and one of those foals, Dubawi, is now one of the most influential influential 
uh, sires in, anywhere in the world. So it, the, those genes can carry on, and let's hope they do in, in tribute to a fabulous racehorse. And you look at the likes of Scat Daddy, who we did mention, I believe, last week with mm. Todd Fletcher, and he was lost far too soon, but his legacy lived on and created a Triple Crown champion in Justify, and then we'll see what his progeny do on the track, and we can always reflect. I think that's what um, is beautiful about the fact that we have social media nowadays, because we do have the ability to capture these incredible moments on the track and remember these incredible athletes for all that they've done and the joy that they've brought us, because I'm um, I will say that's why we're in this game. We're in this game for the horse and the feeling that they give us on the track and in the barn. So um, thank you to them. And, and Nick, thank you for bringing both of them up so we could pay a uh, nice tribute to both of them. No, I'm mean, not at all. And I think, yeah, they're both horses who certainly for me left indelible impressions. Pleasantly Perfect won the first Breeders' Classic. I was a, a Breeders' Cup Classic. I was ever out live when Mandela had the four winners on the day and it was 105 degrees or whatever it was. Amazing horse. And, and Arrogate, um, our friend and colleague, Matt Bernier, wonderful judge, said the other day he thought he was the best horse he'd seen in the flesh in his infuriatingly short life. But um, <laughs> but I, I would I would I would concur. Certainly the best the best U.S. horse I've ever seen in the flesh. I mean, Frank, all the mm -hmm. best horse I've seen in the flesh, but best U.S. horse, definitely uh, Arrogate. And what he did in, in Dubai was nothing short of amazing. No, it was remarkable, and it gives me chills when you think back on it. And Mark, I know most people know of American Pharaoh and California Chrome and Justify for what they did, and Arrogate, perhaps to the general public, didn't quite get his due. But I believe, were you on site at Santa Anita when he beat California Chrome in the Breeders' Cup Classic mm. back in 2016? Yeah, it was a great race. It was a great meet. It was. Yeah, it was uh, be before my time, unfortunately, going to the Breeders' Cup, uh, I've been going the past two years, so I, I look forward to so many memorable moments to come. But Mm -hmm. Again, I say it every week, hearing you guys talk about this, this storied history and all of these amazing horses and trainers and, and jockeys, it's really uh, just inspired a new passion for the sport for me. So thank you. I'm, I'm so pleased and more so because there is now quite a bit more for, for Mark Brinney to, to enjoy because we've got racing rolling in Kentucky and in Santa Anita and, and now Belmont, as, as was featured on the... Today's show today, after 80 days of no sport in, in New York, there is, there is Belmont flying the flag. And thanks to Fauci, a Wesley Ward trainee making his debut. It was a second place finish. It was a part of the open for the Today Show and they did a little segment on it. So it's always wonderful to see horse racing make national news, of course, and Breeders' Cup Challenge Series. That list through June and July is out. I know we were thrilled about that. And it is going to be a very, very busy rest of the year. Um, when you talk about Triple Crown nominations being closed today, you had an extra 22 horses being nominated. A little bit of an odd order in which we're doing things this year, but I think it'll make it memorable. Uh, and I think it's worth noting, you know, we, we are doing this show for our friends at Breeders' Cup. We both work for NBC Sports. You work for, mm -hmm. for TVG. But the endeavor that's gone into getting these Challenge Series races together and getting them on a whole variety of networks, be it NBC or TVG or Fox or networks in the, in the UK for some of the Ascot races, it, it, you know, it, it cannot be um, overstated how much work has gone into getting these, these these broadcasts out there and getting these races on, and especially when there's so little sport going on around the world. So for that, we are eternally grateful. I believe in New York, the Belmont will be the first live sporting event of that nature, that size. Obviously they are running, but this is the first major sporting event that I believe New York will see. So I'm sure, and Mark, you could, you could attest to this, I'm sure New Yorkers are really looking forward to having some sports back. <laughs> Oh, absolutely. You know, New Yorkers love their sports, whether it's football, horse racing, baseball, they get very passionate about it. So everybody's a little <laughs> antsy. So I think we're all very, very welcome and very happy for that to return. And so you're back the next... the track, Nick, on Saturday. Yeah. Wonderful. You looking forward to it? Yeah. The first time I'll have actually set foot on a racetrack since March, the whenever it was, 14th, will be on this Saturday at Newmarket for the 2000 Guineas which will be weird because there'll be nobody there, but we are very grateful. And, and it's a, a fantastic race as well in prospect for all it's running a, a month later than it, than it ought to have done. And you will hear so many times over the next three or four months, including when this show returns in three weeks time, win and you're in <laughs> one man who has been winning, winning plenty 
with a strike rate of seven for 18 at the moment and is now in is a man who just sprinkles good on this game. He is mm -hmm. the great Gray Emotion, to whom I hope we can now say a very good cocktails and conversation evening. Graham, come in. How are you? Hello. 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 Hey, Graham. How are you? Good. Good to see you guys. You have been very, very busy, and you are absolutely on fire. First and foremost, thank you for joining us, because I know how busy you are. But talk about your runners the last, what did you say, seven for 18, Nick? I think yeah, we've had a good run. Not wrong. Um, sorry. Yeah, we've, we've had a good run. I mean, look, it was great to get started at Churchill. That was kind of a bonus. It wasn't really something that we planned on. But once they they started running and we had lots of op options for our horses, uh, we made the move there. I sent Alice to Keeneland and, uh, you know, they've been doing great. I mean, it's I, I can't tell you how gratifying it is to be back racing, let alone winning races. So. Absolutely. Wait, for, where are you right now in the world? I'm at, I'm at Fair Hill. Yeah, okay. which is pretty much where I've been for the last two months. So I really haven't moved around too much. Uh, you know, I'm really fortunate that I have Alice Clapham, who Nick knows well, my one of my assistants, and she does sort of all my traveling. So she went from Florida to Keeneland, and she's been handling the horses that have been running at Churchill. Then my other assistant, Adrian Rolls, he was up in New York today where we ran a couple today. Not quite, didn't do quite so well today. We cooled off a little bit. Anybody that knows Alice remember. knows she is an absolute superstar. Is she not, Nick? She is. And as Graham said, I, I've known Alice since before, you know, essentially before I can remember, uh, because uh, we grew up two miles away from one another in, in Hampshire in England. And she was always a brilliant horsewoman from a fabulous equestrian family as well. And Graham knows uh, how lucky he is. And Alice knows how lucky she is to have found one another. And and they've taken that they've taken the 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 endeavor to a, to a whole new level together so it, it's it's great for for me to see how well she's done with with you graham and and how you guys have have flourished together yeah i pretty much let alice run things sometimes i think i actually work for alice so <laughs> <laughs> but no i'm joking aside i'm just really lucky to have her so these and, are and how, how i was sorry Brett, I, I was going to ask how how have you found the whole experience of the of the last 10 12 weeks graham how, how have you and the family found found managing it well i mean look i i think we've been really fortunate in racing that we've been able to go to the barn every day i mean the horses have to get out the horses have to train so we've had the advantage of being able to carry on working um and you know, as I've said several times on social media lately, we've just been so lucky to have the horses. I mean, we have the this amazing thing that we can go and do every day. I mean, it's not really work for us, let's face it. It's something that we enjoy doing. And to be able to go into the barn, um, the routine has not changed a great deal. I live about a mile from Fair Hill. Um, obviously, everybody's been home. My son, Chappie, has been um, doing school at home. Uh, and, and my daughter's been working from home as well. So... You know, the one nice thing about all this is as a family, we have been together and uh, spending a lot of time with each other. I loved, I believe, was it a photo of sharing your Breeders' Cup, most recent Breeders' Cup winner that you posted the other day saying, thank God for these horses. Yeah, I mean, look, the world's a little crazy right now. So I, I think it's, you know, I certainly, I, I love being at the barn. I mean, that's what I enjoy doing. I don't enjoy as much going to the races because, you know, you get there's a lot to worry about when you go to the races and I, I enjoy being around the horses and the day-to-day -day running in the barn and, and that's what I like to do. So I feel very fortunate to be around that and it kind of takes your mind off of, uh, of all the craziness that's going on right now. There's the photo. Hanging out with sharing as the world around us goes mad. Lucky to have horses. I think, Graham, this is a great segue into Twitter and social media. Uh, you are very active on it. When you look at social media as a whole, what what do you think of it? What's your take on it? Is it a necessary evil? Um, do you enjoy it? Yeah, it's complicated, isn't it? Um, you know, I, I actually had this conversation with my daughter today because with all that's going on with the protests, you know, um, you know, where do you where do you draw the line about how much you get involved with that? I mean, not everybody feels that they should be involved with that, and I, I don't think you necessarily should. Some people want to be outspoken. I, I think social media works really well in horse racing. Um, I think it's a great way to promote the sport, and that's ultimately why I want to be involved with it because I want to promote my stable and I want to promote the sport. And 
you know, show the good things that go on. And I think I think we're going to see it more and more being involved with horse racing, to be honest. I saw some of the jockeys today that rode at home uh, with you guys, Nick, um, commenting on the horses they rode that day on social media. I mean, that is so cool that, you know, to have that insight of how they thought their horses ran and what they might have done wrong. I mean, I think that's that's something that we could use even more over here. Graham, I, I've been using Twitter now for, I don't know, maybe 10 or 11 years, I suppose. But I think in the last year, the professionals in horse racing have have taken their involvement in social media to a completely different level. You mentioned today, Sheen Murphy was coming back in the car talking about all the two-year-olds he's ridden. And, and now because we're, we're so late getting the season started, it's it's mind-blowing how much you're trying to take in. It's not as though you can discard the midweek racing and only concentrate on the weekend when the good stuff comes along because there's good stuff all the time and you're getting these 10, 11 race cars that you guys are used to, but we're not. And to have the professionals giving you their insight instantly like that will cement something in your mind much more readily than it will to leaf through a form book. Yeah, and- I mean, I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not a betting guy. I'm not, a ha- I'm not really a handicapper, but I think for insight from handicapping to listen to these guys today would be amazing going forward for the rest of the season. I think, I think you could really use it to your advantage. I think it has a way of drawing in new fans as well, but we all know that there's a flip side to it. You know, it's great for promoting the sport, but at the same time, you do have to handle and deal with some negativity. Any advice for that, Graham? Because I feel like you're really <laughs> great at clapping back. <laughs> you know, I, I was I was told the other day by one of my, my clients who I'm very fond of, and he feels very similarly to the way I do, that, you know, keep tweeting, just don't read the comments underneath. So... <laughs> um, you know, I, I think that that's the downside of Twitter, I think, and, and especially even more for the jockeys, the, the negative comments, um, you know, certainly some negative comments directed towards the trainers. But by and large, I like to see the better side of it. And I think it can be a, a really useful tool. But you you will occasionally put your head above the parapet politically. I mean, and, and have done particularly in the last mm-hmm. turbulent, extraordinary, weird, bizarre three or four years and you know that if you do that particularly in the horse racing world you're likely to get uh, you're likely to get frapped down by a few antagonists yeah I have, been known, I have been known to do that on occasions <laughs> look i i feel like i have a huge following i, I mean i i think i have twenty five thousand followers and if i have an opportunity to put out reasonably my feelings on certain aspects of life I, I don't see why i shouldn't i mean mm. people don't have to follow you if they don't want to um so i i like to use that and i don't you know people make more of it when it becomes a political issue um i, li- I like to use it on a lot of different aspects really all right doing good in the world it doesn't just happen on twitter you and your wife i I really wanted to highlight this and it was something that we highlighted on tvg as a part of our day brightener segment uh what you and your wife have been doing for the medical workers on the front lines um can you tell us a little bit about the gofundme page that anita created and and how you've been giving back yeah so I, i give her all the credit this was totally her deal i mean she's amazing how she comes up with these fundraisers and uh you know, there was a lot of concern when the coronavirus outbreak started of, of people having enough um, protective gear. So she started a a, a, a a fundraiser and pretty quickly raised a significant amount of money. It was quite hard. She found it quite hard to find people that would actually make the, the, the correct um, protective face gear. Um, but she found some companies. Um, we had several people that have worked for us over the years that are now working in hospitals, and, and they helped Anita to to find ways to produce these materials. And you know, I've helped her in the last couple of weeks, actually handing out um, some of the face shields, which is very uh, it's very humbling. Um, you know, when you pull up at an old people's home and they tell you to leave it outside the door not to come in you know it's that it, it's very uh, it kind of brings it all home to be honest graham do you think racing has has shown itself in a good light these last three or four months in terms of being in tune with society as a whole yeah i think we have i think we've handled it really well actually um i was I was um, nervous at the beginning of it when we kept racing in Florida, um, but I think, you know, by and large, everybody's handled things really well. 
Um, I, I think, you know, getting back started in New York, I think is a tremendous boost for that area to have some sports, to have uh, a distraction, if you like. Um, and I think everybody's handled it remarkably well. Um, and I think it's really uplifting for not just for us in the sport and, and for us to um, to sustain what we do, but also for people to, to have something different to think about. I mean, look, a lot of people aren't working right now, and I, I hope it's a distraction for them. And I think, by and large, horse racing has handled themselves really well. I couldn't agree with you more. So cheers to all of those that put forth a lot of work to get these tracks up and running the protocols in place. Um, but also I see each and every horse, men and women to keep their their barn and their employees um, uplifted and, and positive during that time, because that in and of itself can be a challenge, Graham. Yeah, I mean, this is new territory. So I, you know, anyone that criticizes the way that anything's being done, I, I think they should take back and just realize how hard this has been and, and the effort that's gone into this. You know, mm -hmm. I'm very involved in Maryland and I know what Tim Keefe, who heads the Maryland Horse, Horseman's Group, what he's done to get racing going. It's, it's, been, it's been a tremendous balance between um, horse racing and, you know, dealing with the governor who has done an amazing job in Maryland. We're so fortunate to have uh, such a good governor who's so sympathetic to horse racing. And but it's been a struggle to get things going. And I think people don't realize how much has gone into that. And we're really fortunate to have, like you say, Brittany, people that have, mm -hmm. have got this going. And the nice thing for us, Graham, that. yeah, <laughs> is, that, that. is that, is that, <laughs> is that <laughs> we think it's chairs, I don't think, but cheers. No, it's definitely not. Uh, well, and you, you, you might not get through seven of them by the time the hour's out either. You, you got <laughs> you got some catching up to do. I mean, this has been the I, lovely thing that we've been able to catch up every week. I'll be missing you guys. I miss you guys too. It's been too long. I mean, normally we'd be prepping for Royal Alaska right about now, which Graham, we will be discussing with you. But uh, Mark, we need to cheers all of those that have put forth such incredible work to get things up and going. And with that, we have a cocktail on hand, do we not? Absolutely, we do. So one of my favorite things about the old fashioned cocktail is how easy it is to do quick and unique variations off of it. So the first mention of what we know as the old fashioned cocktail was in a newspaper in New York back in 1806. And it described it simply as being a mixture of spirits, sugar, bitters, and water. And when you hear it described like that, it makes sense that we can take a more common recipe of whiskey, white sugar, and Angostura bitters, and turn that into something completely new just by changing a few ingredients. So we could have a tequila old fashioned with agave nectar and mole bitters. Or we could have a rum old fashioned with molasses as the sweetener and tiki bitters. Or today, for instance, we can have a bourbon old fashioned with maple syrup and black walnut bitters. A lot of variations you can mm -hmm. do, a lot of fun you can have. So to make this old fashioned variation, we are gonna need, of course, Maker's Mark bourbon. Mm -hmm. We'll need some good quality maple syrup. So I actually have one here that's aged in whiskey barrels. So I'm trying to take it up another notch, but any good quality maple syrup will do. And then we're gonna need, I know I challenged you guys a little bit to get this ingredient, but I know a lot of people have, have risen to the challenge. We have Fee Brothers Black Walnut Bitters. You see how ugly that bottle looks? That's because I use it so much. Because <laughs> yes. I love these bitters. I reach for them all the time. And Fee Brothers in general, it's a great brand because not only is it a high quality product, but it's at an affordable price point. You can get one of these bottles for about $10, which in the realm of bitters is really not bad. Sometimes it goes for as much as $25 a bottle. So this is really great. They offer a lot of flavors. Uh, so you can really experiment a lot with different types of bitters. Now, because we're dealing with mostly spirit ingredients, I know we've spoken about this in the past, we're not incorporating any juices or creams. We know we're gonna stir this cocktail. But what's really nice about the old fashioned is you can get away with stirring it right in this, right in your glass that you're gonna be serving it in. A nice rock glass, doesn't get easier, right? <laughs> I didn't need my gold shaker. Yeah. <laughs> You still need your shaker. We're going to put it to good use in the second half of this season. Don't worry. Uh, we Perfect. are going to need a stirring spoon. And then for garnish, we're going to need an orange and a peeler. All right. So nice and easy. The first thing we're going to do, I'm going to try to lift up this glass a little bit so you can see. We're going to do two dashes right into our rock glass. So right in there. Now, again, bitters are basically a maceration of herbs, roots, and barks sort of a bittersweet component, but they add a lot of depth to cocktails. So you don't want to skimp on those. They add a lot to your, your finished drink. Now, the next thing that we're going to do is our sweet component. So if we go back to, you know, bitters, sugar, water, spirits, that was our bitters. Now we're going to do our sweetness. We're going to do a quarter ounce of maple syrup. 
What you don't want is an overly sweet old fashioned. I think a lot of people can agree on that. You don't want it to taste like candy. You want to respect the spirit. So we're going to do just a quarter ounce of maple syrup. And again, this is going to go directly into the Ross glass. You're going to see how easy this is. Nick, are you praying? Okay. What was that? <laughs> no, I was respecting the spirit. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Uh, I, I love the, I love the, uh, the comment from one of our regulars here, uh, Jennifer, who says, I had no idea Mr. Graham was such a sweetie. This is a treat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, ignorance is bliss is all I can say. <laughs> I think that's one, one of the beautiful things about this show is that each week we're seeing everybody so excited that they get to see everyone in a relaxed environment. Mm -hmm. So opening up in their homes with a glass of wine in hand and really kind of, you know, getting a peek into their, their private life in, in a good way. So that's really been one of the, the beautiful parts of the show, one of the many beautiful parts. Mm -hmm. um, so guys, I just added two ounces of Maker's Mark bourbon into the glass. So we've got all of our ingredients. At this point, you're just going to fill your glass with ice and we're going to start stirring. Now, any ice will really do here, but I keep saying this every week. If you happen to have a large ice The big cube, one? The big ones. It's <laughs> that really going to help huge. out. That is huge. I know. I, I think I'm predictable at this point, right, Brittany? <laughs> no, I'm just catching on. I'm really soaking up all the information yeah. you're giving us. It's great stuff. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. So, guys, now we're just going to stir right in the glass. I'm going to try to bring this up. I'm right-handed, so I'm going to stir clockwise. If you're left-handed, you can go the other direction. We're just going to keep that smooth motion. You see how the, uh, the ice is moving with the spoon. That's what you really want there. Okay. There's only room. Keep... There's only Mark, Mark, there's only room for one smooth motion on this broadcast. <laughs> and he's in you? the bottom left-hand not... corner. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you do that very okay, well. I was going to say, that's definitely not Nick. He's not the smooth motion. So I knew it had to be Graham. <laughs> <laughs> Graham, what is your know. drink of choice? I'm drinking a Chardonnay. I usually drink a white wine or a beer. I think, Nick, are you on the Chardonnay as well? Are we all I'm three not, of I'm us? On, I'm not actually this week, uh, Britt. I'm, and obviously, I, Mark knows I like an old-fashioned as well, but I just didn't have the, the walnut bitters this week, so I couldn't yeah. participate. But I'm on a – you probably can't see because it's uh, – It the, looks the like water. Right. It's a rosé. Oh, yeah. Oh. That's, a, that's a very pale rosé. It's rose a very day. light rosé. It's rosé. a very pale <laughs> rosé. It's also – it's a very that, nice rosé as well. Is that pretty pretty dry as well, Nick? It's a, it's, a, it's as dry as a actually what the simile I was going to say <laughs> is not is not for a family show, but it is very dry. <laughs> it's, Excellent. It's, Mark take it away. Help us very out. Dry. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, going back to the old fashioned. So we are going to do a nice orange peel. This is very very classic for an old fashioned. Um, now we were talking about this last week when you have citrus peels as garnish you want to make sure you express those oils by twisting the peel onto the surface of the drink and then rub that peel around the rim. That way you're really taking advantage of everything the citrus has to offer. Mm -hmm. It's also going to add another flavor there. So you want to see it as kind of like the last flavor in the cocktail. But look at this. That's a really, really nice variation on an old fashioned seasonal fun, Gorgeous. but you know, get, get creative, swap out the bitter, swap out the sweetener, the spirit. Mm -hmm. Cheers guys. Enjoy. He's challenging well, well our, our viewers this week. Yes, cheers to that. That looked delicious. Also, we've been, um, Graham, on our show just creating random horse names by things that we've been saying. Is there a smooth motion out there? I think that would be a great horse name. I don't, I don't know if there is a smooth motion. We might have to look well, into that. We might have to. Add it to the list. I don't, how do you feel, Graham, now about being the second most famous motion in your, <laughs> in your family? Yeah, it's a it's a challenge. Um, because wherever you've been in the world, the, the the team motion have come with you, and it's fair to say that your your daughter Jane is a is a a force of nature who is uh, who who captured the hearts of most. First of all, as a very young. Oh no! Hang on a minute. What's going on here? <laughs> Hi, Dad. <laughs> Where are you, Jane? I am in Montauk in the Hamptons. I'm living life. I love it. Obviously. <laughs> that Obviously. sounds lovely. Of course. Montauk of course. In the Hamptons. Yeah. Of course. <laughs> yeah. So I'm heading back home after the weekend to be back with my lovely mom and dad. So I'm excited. And did you get to spend quite a bit of time down in uh, in Fair Hill during the, the, the lockdown? 
Yes, so I've been there for probably almost three months, and then I just came here to spend some time with one of my best friends, um, just to have a change of scenery for a week, which has been really nice, but still working from home, just at a different location. Um, but yeah, I'm excited to be back home, actually, which is a funny feeling, because I haven't lived at home since high school this often, so um yeah, but I've had a great time spending some quality time with my mom and dad, and mm -hmm. I'm excited. Jane, you, your family seems really close. I mean, for you being, you, you show up all the time at the races. You, you can tell that you absolutely love it. You love the, the racing in the afternoon, and I don't know if you go out in the mornings, but I mean, tell us a little bit about your family dynamic, because I think outsiders looking in just love the motion team. <laughs> I mean, it's definitely a great dynamic because there's so much passion in it. I think my mother, especially, she, is such a big part of the team. And so seeing my mom and dad kind of join forces together to kind of conquer the business and the horse racing world in general, it's very inspiring for me and makes me more passionate about it at the end of the day. And I love going in the morning, especially in Saratoga, my favorite season, obviously. Um, and that's probably when I spend the most time at the racetrack, which I look forward to every year. It's kind of like coming home and seeing all my racing friends and my racing family. And I love spending that extra time with my dad. And it's kind of like the one time where I can really focus more on racing um, because obviously I'm working in New York City. So I don't spend as much time in it as I would like to. Um, but yeah, I think it's very special to have a family that's so involved. And the fact that my mother and my father are both very fa passionate about it makes it even more worth it for me to be involved. So. I love it. Um, JMO, seeing you up there in the Hamptons, it seems a far cry from our, <laughs> our first meeting when <laughs> perhaps you'd like to share with- Oh, you. Nick, you know I love this story. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was Nick's PA for, was it Haskell? That's a, I, well, it, no, because it was a Belmont Park. It was the, it was the Belmont Derby, wasn't it? Belmont yeah, Oaks and Derby. Haskell as well with you then, but. Belmont, it was Belmont Derby, yes. And I got the pleasure of wiping the sweat off of Nick Lutz's head before an interview. And it's to this day on my mean, Some of my best memories is working with you and Brittany. I mean, I had to work with Brittany for mm -hmm. Derby too. Do you remember that the pouring rain? Uh, oh my goodness. That was, that was my very first Kentucky <laughs> Derby. And I was nervous as all hell as Jane, I'm sure knew. And uh, Jane, yeah, Jane and Leo were with me, helping me calm down. And we were stuck in the car for hours. I think, I think it was driving it around was, the backstretch. You did. <laughs> Right. <laughs> it was pouring down rain. Um, I remember doing the walkover and thank goodness that we had your car, Graham, to hang out in or else we would have been wet dogs by the end of it. Um, good times. Thank you for being there. <laughs> it's uh, it's fun to look back on on those moments. Had you ever, Jane, wanted a career in horse racing? Was that ever um, something that interested you? Yeah, I mean, I still do. I think I think about it a lot. I think my main goal when I graduated was I wanted to get as much experience out of racing before I dove into the industry. Um, I wanted to know the ins and outs of how I'm in brands, uh, global brand PR. So I'm working a lot with major corporations and how they attract to consumers, which I think is so important for horse racing to take a new approach in the future of um, attracting younger people that are my age right currently. Um, so I kind of wanted to get the general experience of working with corporations and consumer brands and how they do it to attract their younger audiences. Because I think that horse racing is so centered on the horse fans, which I think is it's unique to think about it in a different perspective of how the everyday person who's my age would be attracted to a sport because I think it's has so much opportunity and I love my favorite thing is bringing my friends to the races mm -hmm. so I'm hoping that I get as much knowledge as I can and to kind of approach it in a different way to mm -hmm. make it successful in the near future um because I, I, I 
No, I was going to say, I'm very similar. I never expected to work in horse racing and my father never expected or really pushed me into it. Graham, was, would you enjoy seeing Jane a part of the sport? Yeah, definitely. I mean, look, I, I think like Jane says, she feels very passionate about bringing people to the races, getting young people involved. I think we all do. And I think, uh, of course, I'd support her 100% if she got involved. So, I think that it's racing has a future of younger younger people and younger generations to be into it and i think it takes looking at industries that are similar in entertainment hospitality and how they approach situations and how they get new consumers to come into the their in, um, industries and how they get them to attracted to it and i think that that's important for racing to look at that in a holistic way so that's how i'm trying to get as much experience as i can before I would dive into anything in the actual industry. So that's great. That's Jane, amazing. Can, can, now, what's happening here? <laughs> Is that Drake? <laughs> Looks like me hanging with Drake. That is yeah. a picture yeah, I received insane. from my parents. Um, they went to a wax museum and wax figure museum in Vegas. And I swore it was Drake when I first saw it and I had a mini heart attack because I was so jealous, but then I realized it was fake. <laughs> we kind of have a tradition of going to Vegas after the Breeders' Cup if it's in California. <laughs> so did you go this year and celebrate the victory? We did not this year, but we have we have most years that we've gone out there. We love to go. And that, a I can't believe Cup's that wasn't been... Drake. <laughs> <laughs> it was very good. Uh, yeah. Breeders, Breeders' Cup's been great for, for you as well. I mean, you've not run that many horses, but your your stat sheet is is pretty incredible, really. And how how much of a thrill was it for you to win a Breeders' Cup race this last time with a, a daughter of a player that you'd won a Breeders' Cup race with? Yeah, it was really special. I mean, Shared Account was one of my favorites anyway. She's one of my all-time favorites. Um, her and Filmmaker, who also, Filmmaker was really unlucky. I mean, she mm. ran up against Ouija board, hit the board twice, um, but never won it. Shared Account was um, a very special filly for us. She beat Midday, uh, Henry Cecil's filly at Churchill, um, which was a huge moment for me to beat, to beat a trainer that I grew up admiring so much. Um, and so then to train her daughter was, it was extraordinary. Um, this filly has a lot of traits, similar traits to shared account. She's very kind, very generous, um, just a lovely classy filly to be around. So it, it was a special moment. Any Breeders' Cup win is special. I mean, that's the, that's the Holy Grail. You know, the beginning of every year you want to get to the Breeders' Cup, or certainly I do. That's where I want to be. Go, on, go ahead. No, 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 no. I, I'm no, always I jumping it was... in. <laughs> it was on on the tip of my tongue. Of your your four Breeders' Cup winners, and and that one, I, I spoke to you before sharing ran, and you seemed very quietly confident. But of, of your four Breeders' Cup winners, was there one that just really stood out to you, or or perhaps um, you reflect on more than the others? Well, I think I I was quietly confident in sharing, probably more so than any of my other wins. Um, I mean, keep in mind, Better Talk Now was 27 to 1 when he won. Shared Account was 40 to 1, I believe. Um, main Sequence was the short price, but he was also a little tricky. So, look, I think Better Talk Now was special. Lone Star was a special Breeders' Cup. That was my first Breeders' Cup. I mean, for me to show up in Texas with, I think we ran three that day, uh, maybe four, actually. We ran four in my first Breeders' Cup. So that was extraordinary and to win with better talk now um who we almost didn't take i mean i think had we not had other horses to go that day we probably wouldn't have gone with better talk now um so it was it was extraordinary and he became a bit of a breeders cup legend how many editions did he run in he was there yeah, every year ran, I, could... I think he ran five years in a row and had he yeah. won at churchill i mean he would have gone down as one of the all-time greats he just got beat by red rocks um, I think I remember the defeats as well as the wins. I mean, Animal Kingdom being second um, to Wise Dan, that was a tough beat. Um, I think we were second with Rebellion in the mile and obviously Better Talk Now being second and, and some of Filmmakers second. So um, you remember the wins, but you remember the beats too. <laughs> yeah. The, the funny thing about um, about the Animal Kingdom, well, it wasn't you very funny. You can't believe he got beat. About... <laughs> well, 
the, 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 the deal with he still gives me a hard about, time about it who mr ramsey <laughs> oh does he the, the 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 thing about the thing about uh, the animal kingdom defeat to Wise Dan is because Wise Dan had become such a cult hero at the time, mm -hmm. uh, and he won. Everyone went, "Well, he's won." No one really realized how unlucky Animal Kingdom was. And you run that race nine times or ten times, Animal Kingdom might have won seven or eight of them. Yeah, I watched it again recently, and I was pretty shocked at how bad a trip he had. I mean, really, mm -hmm. Raphael did not get to ride him until within the last eighth of a mile, and he hadn't run since February. People forget that. Um, so he was an amazing horse. Miss him. When Animal Kingdom went to Dubai, I don't know if we have the video on tap because I, I didn't mention it, but I believe, Jane, you were in Dubai, correct? Yes. My there was in the world. <laughs> there was this moment of almost disbelief on your face, Graham. And I think, Jane, you had to hit him like you won. <laughs> what, what was going through your head? <laughs> He's very humble when he wins a race obviously that's who he is but i think it every race moment major moment i've watched it's always been me and my brother and my mom being like hello we just won and it's like when it hits him it's like pure jubilation but that was a crazy crazy win i, I just i don't think i expect to win those races you know when you get in racing you aspire to run in those races but i don't think you expect to win them you know if you told me I was going to win a Kentucky Derby and a Dubai World Cup, I would have said you were crazy when I started training, you know. So I think it is almost disbelief when it happens. For all of us, I think it's, I mean, I'm so, we're all superstitious, obviously, but it, I try not to think of it when the race runs until that moment. And when it, when you cross the wire and it, it's kind of like an overwhelming, I think it's, I don't want to say it's more overwhelming to watch my dad wins such a crazy race but like because he's so humble in the fact of saying we might like anything's possible it might be a slim chance but when he does it's like i don't know it's so crazy I pinch myself every time <laughs> jane give us a little bit of insight uh pretend dad's not here what what is graham like on race day oh my gosh well i think again superstitions I think everyone in racing probably has their little superstitions but the little things of like I I personally before a race from experience I get nervous about like camera people following daddy and like I'm just because I feel like whenever that camera is in his face I'm like oh we're not gonna win now like I'm just kind of it's a feeling that I've always had growing up um is it's so nerve wracking. And I think he's nervous, but he's also so composed in everything, like just leading up to the race, you wouldn't think he's nervous until you, until you get to that moment and they're getting in the gate. That's when you kind of see it more in him, but he always tries to hide from the camera. So I'm usually don't see him in that moment, but, um, that's useful to know anytime I need to find you're, Graham Motion for you're an pretty interview. pretty good at finding me, Brittany. <laughs> I found you at Arlington. I was out of breath running to find you. I thought I was going to lose my yeah. job if I didn't find you. <laughs> he she just, by himself. She just, she leaves me with Chad. She leaves me with Chad and and, uh, and runs off to find Graham. <laughs> but I think you don't, it's not really talked about. I think he always has good faith in what the result's going to be. He always has obviously faith in his horse if he's running it in the race, but um, it's always a question. I Even if we're the favorite in the race, it's like you can't think that you're going to win anything. So I think I really don't hit any kind of shock or I'm more nervous than him. And at least I, I show it more than he does. So it's, it's really, I love being around him because it's very humbling to see how he approaches everything and how composed he stays all day. Cause I'm like, you're running in the Derby. Like you have a favorite. How are you not shaking like I am? But that's just who he is, which makes him so amazing at what he does, I think. That was a great question, Nick. Did you see it in there from Michelle, I believe? I wonder if Graham remembers that he didn't know how uh, to get to the winner's <laughs> circle for Animal well, Kingdom. That's a funny story because um, you know, I wasn't that familiar with Churchill Downs and we did, you know, it was a, it's a big deal when you run in the Derby, you know, you have to reserve your box. And first of all, it's hard to find your box. Mm -hmm. So once we got up into the box for the race, we watched the race, um, won the race. I had no idea how to get to the winner's circle. 
And so between the jubilation of winning, the jubilation and disbelief of winning the Kentucky Derby, um, and then realizing you've actually got to find your way to the winner's circle, I didn't know where to go. And it just so happened that one of the first people I ran into was Dale Romans, who we just beat, um, who's grown up in Louisville. All he wants to do is win the Derby. So, you know, he's devastated that we beat him. Um, so I'm like, Dale, I don't know how to get the winner's circle. He's like, follow me. And Dale's like a linebacker, you know, so I literally grabbed onto the back of his jacket and he took me down to the winner's circle. I was holding on to dad. We were all shuffling through the crowd. Yeah. I'll never forget that. And then he came back and beat us in the Preakness. Yeah. <laughs> that was quite gracious well, of him, though. Good Derby day. Yeah. <laughs> He's yeah, like, yeah, oh, it's it's very hold on. We're going in the winners. Mm -hmm. <laughs> special, special it. memories. Special memories. Now, Jane, we asked uh, Graham earlier what his cocktail is, and he is very straight bat, just a glass of wine or a, an occasional beer. Are you going to deviate from the beaten track? Mm -hmm. what's, your, what's your tipple of choice, either this evening or any evening? Um, I'm a rosé girl myself, but I also love tequila. I love Casamigos and anything. Um, I love a margarita. We've been recently making watermelon margaritas, which I'm a huge fan of. Water, I feel like it's Ooh. a very summery drink. Um, but yeah, I usually just stick to wine. I love a Stella because of my dad, that's what I grew up watching him drink. So now <laughs> go to beer order. <laughs> of him. So yeah, I think I... Don't really get too crazy. <laughs> Parents have, well, have such an influence. Yeah. Maybe, maybe Mark Tuberty will give you a new cocktail Ooh, to drink to add yeah. to the repertoire. Absolutely. But there I guess the, the watermelon margarita, that's a good call. Because you can kind of make the argument for hydrating while you dehydrate there. There's a fair amount of water in there. So I, I definitely support that. But today we're going to be making an awesome variation on a gimlet. So you guys may remember that a few weeks back when we were making the cucumber martini. I mentioned that essentially what we were doing was starting with a vodka gimlet and then layering the cucumber flavor onto that. Now the original gimlet, just like the Cosmopolitan, would have called for Rose's lime juice, which is a clarified sweetened lime cordial. But these days we were talking about this, people are really embracing fresh ingredients in their cocktails. So the common variation of the gimlet calls for fresh lime juice and simple syrup. So today we're gonna start with that base again of the vodka gimlet and we're gonna pair it with seasonal flavors that really complement one another. So we're gonna be doing strawberry and basil. I think you guys are gonna love it. Uh, we are gonna need our Tito's handmade vodka, as always. I always turn it the wrong way. It's that mirrored image. You know, I'm just not used yeah. to it yet. Uh, we're gonna need some fresh lime juice. I've mentioned it every week. You wanna make sure you squeeze your juices fresh every day. Uh, they will oxidize over time. So you wanna get the best possible flavor. Simple syrup. Brittany, Nick, how many times have I used this over the course of 10 episodes? I think- Every week. Every I week. So, <laughs> I, even, I even made it one week. Yeah, it's, and once you do it once, you see how easy it is, and it keeps in the refrigerator for a good couple of weeks. So yeah. it's definitely worth investing in. Have it on standby for your cocktails. Uh, you can use it in so many different ways. Now, this week, we're gonna need some strawberries. I put this on the same plate. I'm gonna try to do my kelp thing. Strawberries oh. and fresh basil. My favorite. And this, yeah, this is definitely gonna be a shaken cocktail. So we're gonna need our cocktail shaker. We're gonna need our fine strainer. We're gonna talk about that more later on. I know it's, it's like the large ice cubes. I bring this up every week. Uh, but we're also going to need our chilled coupe glass or martini glass works. And most importantly, our muddler. We're going to get a lot of use out of this this week. All right. So the first thing that we're going to do to make our strawberry basil gimlet is muddle our fruit. So we're going to take two strawberries and put muddle that right into our fruit. tin. Muddle our fruit. Now, Nick, if you were to guess, is this a forceful muddle or a gentle muddle? Let's it's going to be a... I think, given the given the way that you're flexing your forearm, Mark, <laughs> I'd suggest that it's going to be a forceful muddle. You are correct, sir. You are correct. So yeah. with with fruit, you know, the main goal is to is extract as much juice as possible, and we Ooh. don't have to we don't have to worry about over muddling fruit. But our next ingredient, which is the basil, just like the mint, when we were making the south sides a few weeks back, we want to be careful not to over muddle that. It can become bitter. So there, our goal here is to kind of caress the oils out of the basil, but not pulverize it. So we're going to do four. Caress deep, the oils. Caress the oils. <laughs> Nick, don't say anything. I know what you're thinking. All right. We are going to do a gentle muddle on this, and we're really just going to try to just break the cell walls of the, the basil leaves, but not pulverize it. We don't want to rip it. We just want to release some of those beautiful basil oils. Okay. So at this point, we've got our flavors developed. 
We've got our strawberry and our basil. And we're going to build that classic gimlet on top of that. But I think this is a great opportunity to tell you, you can get creative here. We're doing strawberry and basil, but you could do peach and rosemary, blackberry and thyme. Think of it mm -hmm. like food. Pair flavors together, whatever you really, really like, whatever's in season. You really want to make sure you're buying fresh produce. Uh, so this is a great opportunity to get creative. All right. Now we are going to go ahead with the rest of the gimlet. So we're going to do three quarters of an ounce of our fresh lime juice. And then I like the as blackberry always, thyme idea. That sounds good. I've, I've done a blackberry thyme shrub, which is a whole, we'll, we'll get to that in the second part of the series. It's like a vinegar based yeah. syrup. That we have to build up to that. <laughs> it's a truly yeah. mid season <laughs> finale drinks. You're challenging yeah. our viewers, but it's good. <laughs> exactly. By the time we it's get cool. to week 16, Where's we're going to be clarifying things and fourth carbonating and smoking. Who knows? Mm -hmm. um, so Graham went gonna... to go get all the cocktail ingredients. <laughs> <laughs> He's picking the base. Getting the Tito's. So every time we have our sour ingredient, we need to balance that out, right? So now we're going to do the same amount of simple syrup that we did for the lime juice, so three quarters of an ounce. This is going back to our classic sort of sour ratio. We've spoke about this in the past as well. Two parts spirit to three quarter part each sour and sweet. So finally, our Tito's handmade vodka. Mm -hmm. So two ounces going directly in here. All right, and then we're definitely gonna shake this. So after I pour this, we're gonna fill our shaker with ice. And then, you know, a cocktail like this, you wanna give it a good shake. This would be a great opportunity for Nick to read off some stats or something, because we're gonna shake it for a little bit. Shake it to but, wake um, him up. I, shake it to, I haven't to wake got it the, up. Todd Fletcher, um, the Todd Fletcher special All right. from last Wait. week. I'm, I'm gonna let Nick get ready with that. So what was Todd drinking last week? It looked like um, red wine. Was it a cab? I think it was, yeah. You had no idea that he was drinking anything until about 45 minutes into the show. Yeah. It all of a sudden appeared. <laughs> I actually love vodka gimlets, and I feel like people are always don't know what they are when I order them. So this is great. I love me. Yeah. You know, so I work at the 21 Club in, in Midtown Manhattan, and we have a fair amount of older clientele that mm -hmm. remembers the original gimlet with the roses. So yeah. I have to ask, you know, but this fresh version of the gimlet is just so delicious, so refreshing. And just like you were talking about with the watermelon margarita, when you're going to the warmer months, this is exactly what you want to have in your hand. So good. All right. I'm going to go ahead and give this a quick shake. Shake, we'll shake, shake. Nick, Nick chimes in. Do you have any stats there? Is this, a new, is this a new shaker? Have you got a new shaker this week? No, it's the same one. Why don't it's I okay. pull up? <laughs> All of Graham Stakes victories. <laughs> Look at that, the, ma the master at work. He's Come going on. redder and redder and redder. <laughs> He'll be even redder than me by the time he's finished. Oh, here we go. Um, Barbara Fritchie, Les Prevents, uh, Old Forester Mint Julep Steaks, Orchid Steaks presented by Root and Riddle, British Cup Juvenile Phillies, Turf, Glen Falls, Lake Placid Steaks, Massa Steaks, Long Island Steaks, New Kent County, Virginia Derby. Graham, could you have won any more tough to say races? La Prevent, Ocean Port Steaks, Woodford Reserve, Manhattan Steaks. Are we done yet? Sky, Sky Classic, wow. Pimlico Special Steaks, Pitt Oak Valley View Steaks. There are so many. I'm not even like a quarter of the way. Are we done? <laughs> Kentucky Derby and the Dubai World Cup. <laughs> My goodness. Yeah. Didn't even get close to those because he's got so many recent ones up there. <laughs> <laughs> that That's quite the list of achievements there, Graham. Wow. I'm a lucky right, guy. Jane, Jane, you must have been to the 21 Club, haven't you? What's oh in Midtown? Yeah, I haven't actually. That's a bar I oh, have. Your invitation is about to arrive, courtesy of Absolutely. the chief mixologist. When the world opens up, I'm I'm there. <laughs> I would love to have you by. You and your dad come by. Nick, Brittany, Brittany, your whole We're family. all coming. Let's all yeah, go. Yeah. So Mark, when I'm do looking you think forward to getting? When do you think that actually might start happening? Daddy. That's a good question. So it, <laughs> actually, New York City is going to begin its first phase of reopening this Monday, I that's believe. Outside so, dining, right? Wow. Well, no, that's kind of construction. Two weeks after that, we're going to have retail. And then in the third phase, it'll be dining. 21 is absolutely not an outdoor dining space. But you know, who knows? Everybody's getting creative. Maybe we'll figure something out. But as soon as we get back, I would love to have you guys by. Absolutely. We'll have to do that. Awesome, I'm, it's a it's a date. Yeah. Yes. What's the de what's the deal with what you guys can and can't? I mean, Graham, for where you are, for example, can you have people round? 
and sit outside, say, you know, on the patio or whatever, or or it, indoors, or what what can you do and can't do? You know, I think we're not nearly as strict as you guys are at home. Um, mm. And actually, Delaware, we're in a weird spot here because we're right in the tri-state area. I'm a post a postal address is Pennsylvania, which is a mile up the road. Fair Hill, where I train, is a mile. It's in Maryland, and we're also just a couple of miles from Delaware. So. It's hard to follow all the guidelines of the different states. Sure. Yeah. Um, Delaware opened up on Monday. Actually, I know that because one of my assistants went out on Monday night to eat in a restaurant, which I was wow. talking about this morning. So it was kind of interesting to know. And they said it was a really good experience, actually. They were obviously very organized to handle it. And they said they felt very comfortable and it was very well done. So it's yeah. kind of hard to follow in this area just because there are so many different states. And every state has their own guidelines. So. Mm -hmm. Sure. Right. And yeah, so I'd, say, the we're, I'd say they were a fair wheel. Yeah, so much of the hospitality industry is thinking on your feet and making adjustments. So I'm, I'm really optimistic that the whole industry is going to bounce back and, and find a way to make this work, whether it's spacing people out at tables or doing the outdoor dining. Um, you know, it's, it's a resilient in industry and full of a lot of creative people. So I'm looking forward to being back behind a proper bar as much as I love this bar on Thursday nights. And I plan mm -hmm. on being here uh, going forward, but I would love to have all of you guys at 21 share the spectacular history there show you the jockeys out front so many beautiful ties to horse racing and and the legacy there so here just to here wrap up this, yeah here, here. just to wrap up this gimlet so you'll see we've got a beautiful wow. nice pink or red color now wow. we're going to finish it off i did want to mention that you know every week I'm, I'm fine straining shaking cocktails usually to get rid of those little bits of ice which is a relatively small concern they will further dilute the drink but this week, you got to fine strain that cocktail because you want to catch all the strawberry pulp, the bits of basil. We developed these wonderful flavors through muddling, but we still want our drink to look sophisticated and clean. And that's the best way to do it. So what we're going to do now is just garnish with a nice little strawberry as well as one last piece of basil. Remember, when you're garnishing with herbs, you want to give it a light little tap. doesn't have to be much. Just to release Oh, we're not the slapping oil. the mint. Sorry, this is basil. <laughs> This is tapping the basil. That's a whole separate horse. Tapping the basil. Tapping the basil. And let me a show you son of tapping. Cocktail. Tapping the basil. <laughs> All right. Let's see if. Okay. And right. here it comes oh, wow. tapping the basil. Cheers, That's amazing. Awesome. That looks gorgeous. Enjoy, yeah. guys. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers to that. Thank That's you, cool. Mark. Mark Tuberty. When we return, okay. Mark, for the second po second portion of this series, will uh, if if at some point you are back behind the bar yeah will will you be taking us behind the bar in the 21 club i think that's a, a natural step forward is i'm going to speak to the people at 21 and see what we can do you know maybe it's kind of a, a an ongoing tour week by week in different rooms you know we have 10 private event rooms we've got the prohibition era wine cellar downstairs so i don't see any reason why we shouldn't you know move this show on the road and get it to 21. so let's, let's figure that's it out a great huh? idea yeah i'm excited Mark, thanks so much Thank you so much, Mark. Well done. All right. Oh, we'll see you. Don't, don't, don't go away. We want we want Mark back in a minute. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean you can you can remove him for a bit, but but don't, don't leave don't Mark. Completely disappear. There he is. <laughs> Mark, Mark Tuberty, ladies and gentlemen, he will be back oh. in a moment, and then after our after our mid mid season break, um, Graham, you're not going to be here, obviously, for. For Royal Ascot, I don't imagine, but sharing will be, which is super exciting. Yeah, it is. I mean, if you'd asked me a month ago if we could do this, I would have said no way. But it seems like things are falling into place. And, um, you know, Aaron and I, Aaron Wellman from Eclipse, um, we talked about this a lot. And we said, if things work out, we'll do it. Um, but if it's too complicated, we're not going to be able to do it. So we weren't going to press the issue. But so far, things are really falling into place. The Philly's doing great. Um, we won't leave till late, if possible, like around the 16th even, because I want to do her last bit of work here. So, But so far, things are looking like they might happen. When she and came this back a... in her, I was just no, going to say, in her most recent effort, I, did you feel pressure at Breeders' Cup when our first race back yeah. of the season? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean, I think, um, look, of course you do. I mean, you know what it's like. I'm sure your dad felt the same way. And I. Yeah, unfortunately, really... ours hasn't won yet, but it's okay. <laughs> well, he will. 
I mean, look, it's it's so exciting to, to get it back, and then you just want everything to go well. And mm -hmm. not that anybody puts any pressure on on me, but you know, you feel the pressure because you want things to go well. And she ran great, so um, I think she's she's. This is something we wanted to do. I just didn't see it as being feasible at the beginning of the year, but now it's really seems like it's coming into shape and it's a shame we won't be able to be there um, but i think that shows how strongly we feel about taking a shot nobody's going to be able to enjoy the the side of it the um the entertainment side or the fact of being there and, and enjoying soaking in the atmosphere but we really want to give her a shot to run in it and i don't think she'll be missing much by going over she won't miss much here so we'd like to take a shot uh, for my money I, I think this is your best shot yet i i I know there was all the expectation with with Animal Kingdom, and and you've had horses run tremendously well. Miss Temple City ran fantastic mm -hmm. races all than and once, her, but, and her best race was in this race in the coronation. Yeah, yeah, she ran a wonderful race. She and, ran and huge in that race. For me, the the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Phillies Turf last year with Daya and Albinia. Sadly, Daya has just had an injury, which rules her out of the one thousand guineas this weekend, for which she'd have been second or third favourite. Albinia, I think, is one of the best fillies in Europe three or fillies in Europe to have those two behind you made me think it was one of the better editions of that, of that juvenile fillies turf. And, and I, I, I think you've got a, you've got a hell of a shot if you, if you handle the travel. You know, it's, it's an odd year. I mean, I mean, I feel like we've perhaps had better preparation than the Europeans just because we got to race a month out. Um, and I think that plays into our favor. So I feel good about it. Um, I'm excited about it. would love to be there, but it's, Look, it's a challenge of doing it. That's what it's all about. Mm -hmm. Were the logistics incredibly challenging? Is that what you're referring to? You know, it's it's always tricky, but it's, um, like I say, it's pretty much falling into place. I mean, we, we're having done it a few times before, it makes it easier. Um, try to follow Wesley's lead, but that's very complicated, following Wesley. Um, but he's a big help uh, when he can be. So, um, look, I, I can't wait. I, I'd love to be there. Um, look, my it's on my bucket list to try and win a race in Europe, and I think she gives me a great shot to do it. So, Jane, you can unmute now. There she is. Um, ask, it's a bit of a, a, a bit of a, a a missing link at the moment, isn't it? How much would that complete the whole circle and complete the, the CV? For oh, me or for me. Either, either of you. I mean, oh, I for, me, for me, it's, uh, <laughs> I mean, look, I'm, I'm lucky enough to win a derby. I've won a Dubai World Cup. I, I feel like winning a race, I, I think winning international races is such a challenge. Um, I think horse racing, we tend to get away from a comfort we tend to get stuck in our comfort zone and I think it's great to take on these challenges. And I think that's ultimately what racing is all about, isn't it? About seeing who has the best horse and saying my horse is better than your horse. Um, so to go over there and be able to take on Europe's best, I think that they all come to us for the Breeders' Cup. So I think it's only fair that we go over there and take a shot. Uh, exactly. And it, it, it's exactly that spirit, which is why I, I love Breeders' Cup, Jane. And I know that, I don't want to speak for daddy, but I know this is a bucket list item of his forever. I mean, he's always, his ultimate goal was winning in his home country and mm -hmm. such a big race like Roy Ascot that his parents grew up going to and he grew up watching on TV and it's such a big, big goal for him. So it would mean the absolute world for him and for my family if he would win something like that. I know that's always been a dream of his. So he's done Dubai, he's done America with the Derby. So I think England would just top it all off. That's his home country. Well, you have all of us rooting you on, that's for mm -hmm. sure. Nick, where can we watch it? Somebody was asking, are they televising Royal Ascot this year? If you're in if you're in the US, which obviously most of our our viewers of this show are, um, you can watch the action on NBC Sports Network and I think TVG televising a fair bit of the, the action as well um, mm -hmm. from Tuesday to Friday. It's different this year because uh, we can't do the production that Brittany and I and, and Edzo and uh, Dylan would like to do. Uh, Brittany will be at the Belmont Stakes on Saturday. I get to go to Ask It for NBC on Saturday, so there's a, a big a big double header that day, which is which is exciting. Um, but yeah, you will be able to see all the races. So you'll be able to see Sharing Run either on NBCSN or or on Saturday on on NBC. So, so I should come uh, out and hang out with you guys at Belmont and watch Ask It. <laughs> yes. 
100%. I don't know yeah. if I'll be on site that early, but yeah. why not? <laughs> <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> Jane, Jane, I wanted to ask you about Saratoga because uh, you know, nobody really knows how that's going to play this year. But I, I, I've always wanted to know from a what I would call a Saratoga regular and someone who knows how to get the, the best out of that six, seven weeks, how on earth you do it? Because I've done two, two weeks max and I am in pieces by the end of it, in pieces. They have to kind of box me up and send me home. Are we now? So how on earth? How on earth? Um. You gotta pace uh, yourself, Nick. Yeah. <laughs> I can't even handle I mean, five days there. I'm exhausted. I'm like, take me back to the West Coast and I'll sleep. <laughs> if only I'd learned from the master, uh, I, I would have been able to, but sadly, I, mean, I find out. I, like I said in the beginning, I grew up, I've been going to Saratoga since as long as I can remember. It's my, I look forward to it every year. It's where I see all my best racing friends. Um, I'm kind of devastated at the thought of it not being the same this year. I mean, again, it's where I kind of connect back to the industry. Um, and I also have so much fun there. I mean, the restaurants, the bars, the people out of the racing, like I love going to the races every day and seeing all the people that I see every summer that still remember me. And they're like, Oh, remember when you used to hand me the Saratoga special in the boxes? And it's just, it's so special to me that people remember all those traditions and everything that you've watching you grow up too. It's so special mm -hmm. to me. It's like my family there. Um, but you're, I don't know. You're transported back. Give us Jane yeah. for those that eventually will go to Saratoga, your favorite restaurant and your favorite bar. What are the two must go to's? Oh my gosh. Okay. Dango's for bar because it. <laughs> Spot when you're after dinner, drinks, you're meeting all your racing friends. That's the that's the pregame spot. Like that. Graham, have you been to Dangos? Oh, has <laughs> I've dragged <laughs> <to> Dangos. <laughs> I think I have. <laughs> I've dragged them pretty much everywhere at this point, I think, in Zerd. <laughs> which is the best part as well, because I get to go out with my parents, which is so unique. <laughs> and my parents' friends, which is also my favorite. Um, but I think it's, it's funny cause I'll be out with all my racing friends who are trainers to kids. Like, um, I am with Ryan McLaughlin and Aaron McLaughlin, Kira McLaughlin's mm -hmm. kids. And, um, I have so many other friends that our parents are in this industry and like, they'll bring their parents out who are, and I'll bring my parents out and they're all best friends. So it's just a whole big group of us that are all really close and grew up together. Um, after like winning a big stake too or something that day, it's like the best. It's so much fun. Um, oh. Yeah, Dango's for meeting up. It's a safe space mm -hmm. for family, kids, not kids, 21 year olds and up. 21 and over, sure. Um, okay, so <laughs> restaurant. What would the restaurant be? Yeah. I love <laughs> Chianti's and I love Salt and Char and 15 Church. I love them all. I don't know. Salt and Char, <laughs> so good. Salt all right, so well, eventually. Eventually, when we all can, we're all meeting up at Dango's. And yes, Graham, you are coming. I'll be there. Where do yeah. you and finish at Sierra's, right? No, that's like pre pre game. That's like before oh, pre -pre -game. dinner. Pre pre game. You don't that's complete like, the circle. That's before <laughs> dinner drinks. That's like after racing, I feel. Right? We're learning. I'm, Nick, we haven't been doing I'm, it right. I'm doing stuff with Sperry's. I, I don't really go to Sierra's that much, honestly. What is yes? Well, I suppose it's Dangos yeah. and then just quickly yeah. around the Where's corner the to the in sale, spot. sale time. Mm -hmm. It's bring the sales, mm -hmm. Sierra. Right? Uh, okay. Yeah. Well, we have so many well, things we, to look forward to. I've got so I'm so pleased I still have so much to learn about socializing <laughs> in Saratoga. Spend a day and a night with me. I'll take everyone over to the races for the full experience. <laughs> Not too too old now. For, for any such hijinks, be in bed with a cup of cocoa at half past nine, I think. <laughs> more, more, more I don't believe sensible. it. My dad will do a little bit of a, that's his dance move. <laughs> I've been oh, my goodness. Dance, I've been <laughs> dance on occasions in Saratoga. Graham, I need to get you and my dad dancing because he's got some serious moves too. I think this could be pretty epic. I think your dad would be way sharper than I would. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of like... <laughs> hey, uh, I need to. I, I need, love it. I need to. I need to drag this back to the serious business of winning some units on the on the horses. You run a you run a, a horse tomorrow. 
a filly who, well, at least I think you run the filly tomorrow at Belmont called Bradenbury. Uh, in, um, and I just thought it was a nice spot for her. Back, cutting back to six furlongs, ex European horse. Am I barking up the wrong tree? No, I think you're right. I mean, Andrew Stone, her owner, and I have talked a lot about it, and we feel like she's more of a sprinter than a two turn horse. Um, you know, with the configuration of the tracks in America, you're kind of committed to, you either got to run five eights or, you know, you can run a mile at Belmont. But we just think the three quarters might really suit her. Um, I took her all the way out to Churchill for a race and they took it off the grass. But I think she's doing really well. Um, it'll be interesting to see how she runs. Cool. I, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping you're right because I've, I've tipped her on my influential new column. Oh, dear. Um, <laughs> I've been... <laughs> I've been reminded that it's way past my self-proclaimed bedtime. So, um, <laughs> not by me. I did not remind him about it. <laughs> by, our, by our expert production team. So, I guess Brittany, unless unless um, we we we've I, I want to welcome Mark back into the show. Hopefully, by the magic of oh, look at that! There he is. Because it wouldn't be right to end this this half of the season without saying hi to Mark once again. Mark, I hope you've enjoyed spending time with us and you will be back with us on June the 25th. I absolutely will be. That's, that's actually a special day. That is my, my older son's graduation, but we're doing a virtual graduation here what? earlier in the morning. Oh, wow. Yeah, and then later that How night, you, I'll be with you. No, no way you're old enough to have <laughs> oh, a son yeah. graduating. Oh, yeah. uh, you know, it's all skincare, Nick. It's all skincare. But uh, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm super excited. That's going to be a great, great day to celebrate with him and then be with you guys and then do a special dinner with him afterwards. So I'm very much looking forward to it. But wow, 10 weeks, they went by so fast. It's been the highlight of my week. And uh, I love you guys. Yeah, this is awesome. Oh, oh man, Mark. Thank you so Virtual much. Say, you guys have done a great job because I've watched quite a few of the shows and they've been amazing. And I think it's been a great idea and it's been really entertaining and spectacular. Good job. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks to our entire production team behind the scenes. They deserve all the credit putting together yeah. our rundowns, inviting the guests and uh, getting them to stick around for an hour. I don't know how they've convinced anybody <laughs> to sit with us for an hour or more. Uh, but Graham, you were one of our very first guests. I remember a comment coming on week one. I felt like we'd made it. Graham Motion is commenting mm -hmm. on our show. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it. I think it's been really good. It's been really entertaining. He says it often in the kitchen too. Like they do so good. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you guys are you guys are great. Uh, you're wonderful advertisements for this sport and for mm -hmm. and for family. And it's great that during this period that's been so hard for everyone, you've been able to spend some some time with each other as well. So, to all the motions, we uh, we salute you and thank you so much. Um, thank you all. Thank you, Mark, <laughs> Brittany. Thank you. We will uh, talk over the talk back on June the twentieth for uh, between. Uh, Royal Ascot and where I don't have to wear a top hat and tails apparently which is even better <laughs> and uh, and New York uh, and for all of you I hope you rejoin us after this tiny little hiatus back on uh, on June the 25th when we are all set to go for another highly paid 10 week run and if you believe that you'll believe anything from all of us here on Cocktails and Conversations we're checking out night night cheers Take care, guys. Thank you. cheers guys <laughs> Bye.